Welcome to Blue Crane Digital's introduction to the Nikon D5300 digital SLR camera. This camera can record incredibly sharp, detailed photos and videos, but it can't do it all by itself. The quality of the image really depends upon the operator, you. We're going to simplify this complex piece of equipment for you. At the same time, you'll gain the knowledge to record the photos and videos that you want. This presentation is not designed to replace the camera manual. Instead, it focuses on the most important features and controls of the camera. Camera manuals cannot teach you how to shoot great photos. They are designed as technical descriptions of how each component works. They are not intended to explain what the engineers had in mind when they finalized the layout of the buttons and decided how things should work together. Compare the camera manual to the owner's guide in the glove box of your car. You wouldn't dream of teaching yourself to drive just by reading it, would you? So, think of this presentation as a mini driver's education course for the camera. This presentation is broken down into four main sections. First, we discuss topics that determine the look and feel of your images. These include focus and depth of field. Second, we cover settings that affect image quality. This section includes tips for improving composition. This will help you to create the photographs you had in mind. The third section addresses the advanced features. You'll see how they work together to create a correct exposure. Then, once you've taken your photos, we'll show you how to upload them to a smartphone or tablet. You can share them immediately with your family and friends. Finally, we describe how to customize the camera to your shooting style. This can simplify the entire photography process. There is a lot of information to cover in this presentation. It may seem to go by very quickly. Keep the camera close by as you watch. Pause the video after each section and test the settings for yourself. Make sure to try the exercises as well. You'll gain a better understanding of how your camera works. Before we begin, we have a few tips to make learning this camera easier. First, for the purpose of our presentation, we are assuming your camera controls are set to their defaults. If they aren't, the camera may not react in the way we describe. Displays and icons may look different. To avoid confusion, reset the camera before continuing. A two-button reset returns the main camera controls to their defaults. Simultaneously hold down the menu and I buttons for three seconds. Each button has a green dot on the camera body for quick reference. The information display shuts off for a moment. Then, the main camera controls reset to their defaults. These controls include image quality, exposure compensation, and focus modes. Another tip. Consider printing a copy of the complete camera manual. The booklet that came with the camera is a guide to the main camera functions. The reference manual provides more details and includes all the camera menus. You can open a digital copy from the disk that came with your camera. Select your language folder. Then, open the file using Adobe Reader. If you prefer a printed copy, click the printer icon at the top of the screen. Select Fit from the Size option and click the Print box. Finally, make certain the camera's viewfinder is in focus. This diopter control dial will adjust the viewfinder for your eyesight. Look through the viewfinder at the bracket's center screen. Turn the diopter control dial until the lines appear crisp. When the diopter adjustment is off, you won't see the best image through the lens. Your eyes may strain to see the composition. Unless you share the camera with someone, you won't need to make this adjustment again. Music 
The information display on the back of the camera provides a wealth of information on current camera settings. You'll find many of the same icons along the bottom of the viewfinder. This chapter includes a tour of the viewfinder and the information display. We identify icons for the most common camera controls. Before we begin, make certain the information display is active in the LCD monitor. If the monitor is dark, press the info button on the top of the camera. This button turns on and shuts off the information display. Now, turn the mode dial on the top of the camera to P for programmed auto. Look through the viewfinder and half press the shutter release. Brackets at the center of the screen surround the focusing area. When you press the shutter release, it's likely that one or several small boxes lit up inside the brackets. These are the active focus points. They indicate where the camera is focusing. When the camera achieves focus, the focus indicator appears in the bottom left corner of the screen. If the camera cannot focus, this disc may flash or disappear altogether. The indicator may also flash when the focus mode is set to continuous. Just to the right is the auto exposure lock icon, followed by the flexible program indicator. Here we see the flexible program indicator on the information display. AE lock appears below the shutter graphic. Returning to the viewfinder, we see the shutter speed. This number means the shutter is set to open and close in 1 60th of a second. This number means the shutter is set to open and close in 1 1 25th of a second. Shutter speeds approaching 1 second or slower are marked by two ticks at the upper right. This dial graphic represents the shutter speed. Above the shutter speed display is the battery icon. It appears when the battery is low on charge and flashes once the battery is exhausted. The battery icon is always visible on the information display. Next in the viewfinder is the aperture value. Aperture refers to the size of the opening in the lens. A smaller number indicates an open aperture. A larger number means the aperture is stopped down. This graphic does a good job of representing the lens aperture. Note that as the numbers decrease, the opening gets wider. This graph appears when the exposure settings are incorrect, when exposure compensation is active, and when the exposure mode is set to manual. Bars on the right side of the exposure indicator mean that the scene is overexposed. Bars appearing on the left mean the scene is underexposed. On the information display, the exposure indicator is centered below the aperture value graphic. When flash compensation or exposure compensation are active, their icons appear next in the row. Check the current compensation levels here on the information display. Anytime you set the mode dial to a special effects mode, the camera displays this warning above flash compensation. The next icons appear when the ISO is set for auto. This dial represents the ISO setting. An A indicates that auto ISO is active. This shot's remaining counter indicates how many photos you can take before the memory card fills up. When you half press the shutter release, the number changes. Now it indicates how many pictures you can record in one burst of shooting before the memory buffer fills up. This area of the viewfinder can also display the ISO, exposure compensation, or flash compensation values as they are being set. The shot's remaining counter appears here on the information display. This K icon appears when enough memory remains for 1,000 exposures or more. It's followed by the flash ready indicator. Here is the K icon on the information display. While there isn't a flash ready indicator on this screen, this icon shows the current flash mode setting. And finally, this question mark is the warning indicator. It appears on the information display as well. When the question mark flashes, 
press this button to display warning information. We'll refer back to these displays throughout this presentation. This will increase your understanding of the camera icons and settings. The mode dial is where you turn your camera to auto and forget it, right? Millions of amateur photographers never change this setting, but we're going to. First, let's divide the exposure modes into groups so they make more sense. There are auto modes, scene modes, special effects modes, and advanced modes. The advanced modes offer the most control over camera settings. The other modes allow the camera to do most of the work. When you set the camera on auto, it does four things for you. It focuses the lens. It meters the amount of light and distance to your subject. It sets the aperture. And finally, it sets the shutter speed. You snap the photo, you get an average exposure. Nikon expanded on this theme with the scene modes. Maybe your point-and-shoot camera had similar options, but you never got around to trying them. The scene modes on this camera are powerful tools that can help you take great photographs. The camera changes settings automatically to match the shooting situation. This makes it easier to document a bike race or shoot photos of a child's birthday party. You get to be involved in the moment, rather than looking at the camera dials and displays. The D5300 offers 16 scene modes in all. The five most common scenes are on the mode dial. The others are grouped under scene. In order to select one of these 11 modes, set the mode dial to scene. Turn the command dial to scroll through the options. They cover a wide variety of situations, from nighttime shots to seasonal landscapes. There is even a setting that can enhance photos of food. We're going to describe the main scene modes so you know when and how to use them. We encourage you to test all 16 modes yourself. Let's start with portrait mode. Notice that the camera has set a wide aperture. This creates what's called a shallow depth of field. In the resulting photo, the background is soft, but the subject remains in focus. This makes the subject really stand out. The camera also produces softer colors for natural skin tones. The camera may pop up the flash for low light scenes. For landscape, the camera produces sharp outlines and vivid colors. Notice that the aperture is closed down. This creates an infinite depth of field. Everything is in focus. For example, in this image, the mountains in the background are just as well focused as the rocks in the foreground. Because the opening in the lens is small, the shutter stays open longer. This allows the camera to collect enough light for a correct exposure. On cloudy days or in fading light, place the camera on a tripod to prevent motion blur. The child setting is ideal for taking snapshots of people in motion. The camera retains the detail and vivid colors of the background. At the same time, it maintains accurate skin tones. Compare the child and portrait modes. For child mode, the aperture is narrower while the shutter speed is faster. The background focus is still slightly soft, but now the shutter speed is fast enough to capture children in action. In the sports mode, the camera can track subjects using all of the focus points. It sets a fast shutter speed to freeze any action in the scene. When you half press the shutter release, the lens continually focuses on the subject behind the center focus point. The camera refocuses as the subject moves. This setting works well for photographing animals or any subject that might move unexpectedly. Close-up assumes you are taking macro photographs of small subjects, such as flowers or insects. For even tighter close-ups, attach a macro lens to the camera. The flash offsetting is just like full auto. Choose this exposure mode if you don't want the flash to automatically pop up in low light. Now, let's look at two of the options listed under scene. 
The first is night portrait. The camera fires the flash to illuminate your subject. It also sets a slower shutter speed. This allows the image sensor time to collect light from the background. Photos taken with this mode show both the subject and details in the background. For outdoor scenes taken after sunset, try night landscape. The camera disables the flash and sets a very slow shutter speed. Use a tripod to avoid moving the camera during recording. Movement will cause blurry lines and edges. The last item on the mode dial is special effects. These are more like creative filters for shooting in auto. Because they are specialized, we address the effects modes in our advanced section. Scene modes can be a very helpful tool. If you just want to take photos without changing any settings, the scene modes will get you there. Simply match the correct scene mode to the shooting situation. In addition, the scene modes allow you to hand off the camera to someone who is unfamiliar with DSLRs. You won't need to worry about getting poor results. The camera takes care of all the settings. There are three fundamental ways the D5300 can determine where to focus in a scene. We'll illustrate them using the default settings for Auto, Close-Up, and Sports. Each scene mode has a method for selecting a focus point. Turn the mode dial to Auto and look at this area of the information display. This icon, with the 39 boxes, represents automatic focus point selection. When you half press the shutter release, the camera considers the entire frame. It then chooses a subject for focus. Often, the camera selects either the nearest object or whatever is at the center of the frame. This default focus setting is called Auto Area AF. It works for many shooting situations. However, if the camera picks the wrong object, your subject will be out of focus. Next, turn the mode dial to close-up. Now, the icon shows 38 plus signs with just one focus box. The center focus point is active by default. However, you could select a new focus point. This allows you to frame your subject however you like. Press the multi-selector arrow keys to move the focus point to your subject. Press OK to return to the center focus point. You can select a focus point in the sports mode as well. This setting is a little different. Note that the display shows shadowy boxes behind the plus signs. This means all the points have the potential to focus. The camera begins focusing using your selected point. If the subject moves away from your focus point, the others take over to maintain focus. Focus point selection is available for all of the advanced exposure modes. However, you must first take the AF area mode setting off its default. We'll discuss AF area modes more thoroughly in our advanced section. There may be times when the camera can't achieve focus. This can happen when there is little contrast between the subject and the background. The camera also can have trouble focusing when there are objects at different distances, such as the fence in front of this subject. The solution is to focus manually. Move the lens focus mode switch to M for manual focus. In the camera's default configuration, the center focus point should immediately appear. Position your subject behind this focus point. Half press the shutter release. While still holding the shutter release, turn the lens focusing ring. The focus indicator should light up once your subject comes into focus. Manual focus can be very useful in low light. Say you are shooting sunset photos from a tripod. The focus doesn't change as the sun goes down. However, the camera may lose the ability to lock the focus as the light fades. Without focus lock, you won't be able to record more images. Focus on the sunset at the beginning of your shoot. Then, switch to manual focus. 
Now you can continue shooting the sunset. You might be surprised at how often you'll find manual focus to be useful. It's just one more tool you can use to get an extraordinary shot in difficult situations. Let's take a look at Shutter Priority Auto. Remember that in Auto, the camera meters the available light and selects the shutter speed and aperture. Shutter Priority is just one small step away. The camera still focuses the lens and meters the light, but you decide how long the shutter stays open. Then, the camera picks the correct aperture for a properly exposed photograph. The command dial controls the shutter speed. Half press the shutter release to activate the exposure meter. Turn the dial to the right to increase the shutter speed. The camera shutter opens and closes in just a fraction of a second. Watch both graphics as the shutter time grows shorter. The aperture opens up, allowing in more light. A longer shutter time makes the camera close down the aperture. This lets in less light for a longer period. Whichever you choose, the camera will compensate. If the aperture value and warning indicator blink, the camera cannot set a correct exposure with your selected shutter speed. Use the exposure indicator as a guide when adjusting your settings. Turn the command dial until the exposure indicator disappears and the aperture value stops blinking. When would you use shutter priority? Here's one example. This photo was taken with a short shutter speed. The water is frozen in time. By making the shutter stay open longer, the quality of the water changes. In this photo, the water looks entirely different. With the shutter priority setting, you can decide what you want your images to communicate. Why else would you use shutter priority? Shooting sporting events where fast shutter speeds are critical is a common reason. But wait, doesn't this camera have a sports setting? Yes, it does. However, the camera doesn't know the situation. For instance, freezing a dog in mid-splash may not require the same fast shutter as freezing a race car going 100 miles per hour. Rather than use an average setting and risk an average picture, you can take control of your images. The next setting on the mode dial is Aperture Priority Auto. Before we go into detail on this setting, it is important to understand the concept of depth of field and how it relates to the aperture size. The amount of light entering the camera is controlled by the aperture. It's like the pupil of your eye. In low light, your pupil gets larger so you can take in more light. The aperture is displayed as the number just to the right of the shutter speed. The smaller the number, the larger the aperture. So f4 is a larger opening than f11. These are both larger openings than f22. One of the main contributors to controlling the depth of field in a photograph is the size of the aperture when the photograph is taken. I want you to try a little experiment. You can stop this presentation and come back after you're done. First, go to a table in your house. Set a small object, such as a salt shaker, on the front edge. Next, place another object, such as a pepper mill, in the middle of the table. Finally, place a third object on the back edge. Make sure all three line up in a row, as we've shown here. Now, look at the objects from the tabletop level and concentrate on the pepper mill. Look at the details in the mill itself. Once you are focused on the pepper mill, the other two objects will still be in view. Don't focus on them. Focus on the pepper mill. Do you perceive the other objects to be blurry or slightly out of focus? Yes. This is the way our eyes see and our mind perceives the world. We concentrate on those things that are important and let the rest fall away. If we can make the camera mimic this visual experience by shortening the depth of field, we can influence how people look at the photo and how they feel about the subject. Now, step back and look at the whole table without concentrating on any one object. You perceive that all three objects are there, but you really don't notice the detail in any of them. 
The three objects are all included in your visual depth of field. How would it be if we, as photographers, decide what's important to look at? Painters have been doing this for hundreds of years. The artist decides where you focus your attention. It may be a face. It may be an orange on a table. It may be everything. But the difference between a snapshot and an artistic photograph is having the tools that enable us to make choices. We'll discuss composition later, but for now, let's concentrate on controlling the depth of field. When the digital age came along with affordable digital cameras, we could finally take all the photos we wanted and review them instantly. We could take more pictures if we didn't like the results. But go back and look at all those digital images you took with your old point and shoot digital camera. Everything is in focus. We were taking snapshots. There was minimal control over depth of field. Why? Digital point and shoot cameras focus the image on a tiny image sensor. Notice how small the lens is compared to your digital SLR camera. The tiny lens focusing on a tiny chip results in images that have an infinite depth of field. Your digital SLR has a larger sensor. The depth of field possible is much closer to what the human eye sees. Now we are ready for aperture priority auto. For this setting, you adjust the lens opening the camera does the rest. Turn the mode dial to A. Half press the shutter release to activate the exposure meter. Rotate the command dial to the right to close down the aperture. Turning the dial left opens the aperture. In most situations, the camera sets a shutter speed to match your selected aperture. But under extreme conditions, the shutter speed may blink the setting won't produce a properly exposed photo. Turn the command dial until the shutter speed stops blinking and the exposure indicator disappears. There are four factors that determine the depth of field in a photograph. If you understand them, then controlling what is in or out of focus becomes much easier. We just explained how a large image sensor allows for a shallow depth of field. You can change the depth of field by moving your feet as well. Simply stepping closer to your subject will shorten the depth of field. You can see this when taking macro shots of small objects. The closer you are, the more shallow the depth of field becomes. For that reason, if you want to take macro shots with deep focus, you will need to stop down the aperture, to f22 for example. The third factor in controlling depth of field is focal length. Right now, I'm being shot with a telephoto lens on the video camera. My face is in focus, but the foreground and the background have gone soft. Now, we have switched to a lens with a shorter focal length. Notice that the foreground and the background are in focus. Finally, you can control depth of field by adjusting the size of the lens aperture. Pause this presentation and spend a few minutes getting familiar with these controls. Come back when you're ready to continue. When would we use Aperture Priority Auto? As we discussed previously, aperture is a determining factor in setting the depth of field. Sometimes you want an infinite depth of field or deep focus. Other times you want a shallow depth of field. Your composition, subject matter, and context all play a role in finding the right balance. Experiment with taking photos at different apertures. Here is an example. Have your subject stand about 8 feet in front of a background of plants. Stand about 6 feet from your model. Put a telephoto lens on your camera and zoom your lens to 100 millimeters. This is considered a good portrait focal length. Set the camera on aperture priority and open up the lens using the command dial. Take the first shot. Now, Dial the aperture closed and take another photo of your model. In the photo taken with an open aperture, can you see how the subject pops off the page? There is a greater separation between the subject and the background in this image than in the image taken with the aperture closed. Programmed auto is like auto with options. The camera sets the shutter speed and aperture value. 
This usually means a shutter speed that is fast enough to avoid shaky, blurry images. The aperture lets in enough light for a correct exposure. By turning the command dial, you can extend the usefulness of programmed auto. Rotate the command dial to the right to increase the shutter speed and open the aperture. Turn the dial to the left to close down the aperture and lengthen the shutter time. You still get a correct exposure, but you decide what is most important to your composition, the shutter speed or the aperture value. When you are using this flexible option, the letter P and an asterisk appears on the information display. It also appears in the viewfinder. To return to the default P settings, turn the command dial until the asterisk disappears, or turn the mode dial to a different setting, then back to P. Use flexible program mode to freeze the action in your scene or to blur the background. It all depends upon the results you had in mind. Now is a good time to pause the presentation and try adjusting the exposure settings. First, experiment with flexible program mode. Focus on a subject and record an image using the camera's selected exposure settings. Next, turn the command dial counterclockwise to increase the shutter speed and open the aperture. Take a shot. Turn the command dial clockwise. The shutter time lengthens while the aperture closes down. Take another shot. Compare your results. Notice how the composition of your image changes with the exposure settings. Then try changing individual settings in the shutter priority and aperture priority modes. Come back when you are ready to continue. This area of the information display showed you the current settings for image quality and size. These settings are listed in the shooting menu. However, it's quicker to select a quality and size from the information display. Press the I button. Use the multi selector to highlight image quality. Press OK. For most exposure modes, the quality options are RAW and three types of JPEG files. You could also select a combination of RAW and JPEG files. The three levels of JPEG compression are Fine, Normal, and Basic. Fine applies very little compression, approximately 4 to 1. Normal has a compression ratio of about 8 to 1. Basic applies quite a bit of compression, on the order of 16 to 1. If you are shooting JPEGs, the next step is to choose an image size. Press the I button and highlight the image size icon. Press OK. The options are large, medium, and small. Choose large to shoot JPEGs that are 6,000 pixels wide. Medium JPEGs are nearly 4,500 pixels wide. Small results in a JPEG image that is about 3,000 pixels wide. Which image size should you choose? That depends upon how you plan to use the photos. Select Large Fine or RAW to create 13 by 20 poster size prints. The medium setting allows you to print images as large as 10 by 15 inches. Select Small when taking photos for websites or email attachments. The quality will be good enough to print in 7 by 10 format. Don't think of these printing sizes as absolutes. With the proper editing tools, you can print your images larger than the recommended size and still get great results. While large JPEGs are for a lot of data to work with, shooting in RAW really gives you the maximum flexibility when editing your photos. That's because it stores the most original data. When you shoot in JPEG, the camera applies all the tonal properties to the image as it compresses the file and saves it to the memory card. These properties include exposure, color temperature, and picture controls. If you make adjustments on your computer, then you'll sacrifice some of the image data. With RAW, the image data is stored as it's recorded on the sensor. All the tonal property settings are noted, but not applied to the image. 
Another advantage of shooting in RAW is you reduce some of the potential for digital noise. In order to save a JPEG file, the camera must throw out a lot of image data. This compression can create artifacts and add noise to your images. In contrast, the camera doesn't throw away data when saving RAW files. The data is essentially uncompressed. This camera can store 12 to 14 bits of data for each pixel instead of 8 bits for JPEG images. 14-bit files offer a wider range of colors than 8-bit JPEGs. With just 8 bits per pixel, scenes with fine color gradients, such as a sunset, may look blocky. In contrast, a 14-bit file can produce a greater color depth than 8-bit JPEGs. Color gradients will appear much smoother. Raw photos must be opened with special image processing programs. You can open RAW files using the View NX2 software that came with your camera. The program displays the file with the tonal properties you set at the time the image was recorded. You can make adjustments, then save a JPEG copy without worrying about losing any data from the RAW file. One final note about RAW. Third-party software might not display certain settings such as picture control and active delighting. If these settings are critical to your workflow, convert your RAW images to a different file format before opening them in a third-party program. View NX2 lets you convert RAW files to JPEG or TIFF files. Choose 16-bit TIFF images to preserve the most data. The program applies all of the tonal properties noted in the RAW file while sacrificing the least amount of image data. Release mode determines how quickly the camera resets the shutter between shots. The self-timer and remote operations are also grouped under release mode. This button on the front of the camera activates the release mode setting screen. Move the highlight box to one of the release modes. Press OK to confirm. Most new digital SLR owners choose single frame, one of the continuous modes, or the self-timer. Single frame is best suited for stationary subjects, such as portraits, landscapes, and still lifes. The continuous release modes allow the camera to record shot after shot in a continuous burst. Choose high speed for fast moving subjects. The camera fires the shutter up to five times a second. This improves your chances of recording an extraordinary image over a series of shots. When the release mode is set to low speed continuous, the camera records about 3 frames per second. You may prefer the slower continuous speed for long bursts of shots. The buffer won't fill up and stop image recording as can happen with continuous high speed. You will be able to shoot consistently for a longer period of time. The self timer can be used for self portraits or group photos. First. Place the camera on a stable surface, such as a tripod. Press the release mode button and select self timer. If you are going to be part of a group shot, focus the camera on someone who is already in the scene. For a solo portrait, focus on an object that is about the same distance from the camera as where you plan to stand. Move the focus mode switch on the lens to manual. If your lens has vibration reduction, Turn it off. Nikon recommends this when the camera is secured to a stable tripod. Now, remove the rubber eye cup from the viewfinder and attach the eyepiece cap that came with your camera. The cap prevents light from entering the viewfinder after you step away from the camera. The added light can throw off the exposure. Once you are ready, fully depress the shutter release. The camera counts down 10 seconds before recording the image. The self timer can also help prevent camera blur. Camera blur is caused by moving the camera even slightly as it records an image. Placing the camera on a tripod reduces camera movement. However, pressing the shutter release may cause some shaking. Set the self timer instead. Remember to attach the eyepiece cap and turn off vibration reduction. Fully press the shutter release. 
The countdown gives the camera time to settle on the tripod. Any static image destined to become a large print might be a candidate for the self-timer. Once the camera records the image, the release mode reverts to the last selection. Select self-timer again if you want to record more images. Finally, let's look at quiet shutter release. This is like single frame with reduced shutter and mirror noise. The camera also disables the focusing beep. Choose this option when shooting in museums or during important events. On a film camera, ISO refers to film speed. Digital camera designers use this convention from the film world to describe electronic sensor gain. This is when the camera amplifies the signal to make the image bright enough to be seen. Many of you have recorded video in extremely low light situations. Even though you can see the image, the overall quality of the video is not very good. That's because the image was captured by electronically enhancing the sensor. At higher ISO settings, the enhanced sensor can add noise to your images. Your photos and videos may look grainy. The D5300 offers manual and automated ISO control. By default, the camera selects the ISO speed for the auto, scene, and special effects modes. The camera usually chooses a value between 100 and 6400 based on the lighting conditions. Most of the time, you may prefer to leave the ISO setting on auto. That's because the camera does a great job of selecting the right ISO for the available light. Your images will be correctly exposed. However, you may not always like the results. For example, the camera boosted the ISO for this image to 6400. The exposure is correct, but there is a lot of digital noise. If your goal is to get the shot, no matter what, then digital noise won't matter. For the cleanest images possible, you will need a low ISO value. Manual ISO selection offers the most control over image quality. It is available for every exposure mode except auto, flash off, and night vision. With the information display active, press the I button. Toggle to the ISO icon and press OK. Make your selection using the arrow keys. Press OK to confirm. The manual selections range from 100 to 12,800, plus three high settings. High 1 doubles the light sensitivity of an ISO of 12,800. It's equivalent to an ISO of 25,600. High point 3 is equivalent to an ISO of 16,000. Remember, the high settings can generate digital noise in your images. Use them only when it's absolutely necessary. Now, let's look at how to set the ISO in the advanced exposure modes. Press the I button and open the setting screen. The options are virtually the same as those offered for the scene and special effects modes. However, the default ISO speed is 100. Select an ISO the same way you would for a scene mode. Notice that there isn't an auto option. That's because auto works very differently for the advanced exposure modes. First off, it must be activated from the menu system. Since this is our first time navigating the camera menus, we'll walk you through it step by step. Press menu. Press the multi-selector left key to highlight the main menu icons. Use the up and down keys to highlight the camera icon. This is the shooting menu. Press the right arrow key to enter the menu. Use the up or down keys again to highlight ISO sensitivity settings. Press OK or press the right arrow key. Either opens the ISO sensitivity menu. There are several options within the ISO sensitivity menu. For example, you can select an ISO value from here. To turn on Auto ISO, highlight Auto ISO Sensitivity Control and press OK. Select On and press OK to confirm. 
Now, this icon should appear on the information display and in the viewfinder. When the camera activates Auto ISO, it doesn't simply choose the ISO value. Instead, Auto ISO serves as a safety net. The goal is to avoid an incorrect exposure. The camera will try to set the exposure using your manually selected ISO. Auto ISO only takes over when the scene is too bright or too dark to get a correct exposure using the manual value. When Auto ISO is active, this icon blinks in the information display and in the viewfinder. Let's return to ISO sensitivity control and look at maximum sensitivity. This option imposes limits on Auto ISO. The default setting is 12,800. You can see the maximum sensitivity marker here on the ISO display. Consider selecting a lower ISO speed as the maximum. Your goal is to use as little amplification as possible. A lower limit will prevent the camera from selecting ISO speeds that could cause digital noise. At the same time, don't reduce the limit to its minimum. If the camera can't increase the ISO at all, it may slow down the shutter speed to obtain a correct exposure. Your images could show blurry camera movement. If you do most of your shooting outside or where there is plenty of light, you can maintain a lower limit for auto ISO. In the rare cases when you need to boost the sensitivity, just select a higher ISO through the information display. The camera will ignore the maximum sensitivity limit. It will use your selected ISO instead. When you are done shooting, return the ISO to a value that is below the maximum sensitivity limit. Now that we have changed a few settings, let's return the camera to its default configuration. This is something you should do regularly as you work more with the camera. It's frustrating to look at your photos and realize you forgot to change the settings between scenes. Most of us take photos in a variety of locations and conditions. Chances are, at some point, you'll shoot with the wrong settings. Reset the camera and you'll always have a consistent starting point. Earlier, we showed you how to perform a two-button reset. This returns main camera controls, such as white balance and metering, to the defaults. It doesn't affect settings such as auto ISO. You need to reset the shooting menu to return this and other camera functions to their defaults. The menu reset has some overlap with the two button reset. It returns the image quality to JPEG normal for example, but settings such as exposure compensation haven't changed. Here's a tip that will help you remember to reset the camera. Do it as soon as you get home, before uploading your photos. By making a habit of resetting the camera between shoots, you can prevent frustrating mistakes. Nikon's live view can be helpful when shooting still photos at high or difficult angles. In addition, use live view to determine the right height and general framing for your subject when working from a tripod. The large image in the LCD monitor is easy to see as you adjust the tripod. You won't need to look through the viewfinder until you are ready to make final adjustments to the framing. Before you activate live view, remove the eye cup. Cover the viewfinder with the eyepiece cap. Again, this prevents stray light from affecting the exposure. Toggle the live view switch on top of the camera. The camera raises the reflex mirror when activating live view. This allows the image to go directly to the image sensor. You should see a focus point in the live view screen. The type of point depends upon the exposure mode setting. For programmed auto, shutter priority, and aperture priority, a large focus box will appear. The small point inside indicates that the box is center screen. The large box also appears when using live view for several of the scene and special effects modes. These include sports and pet portrait. If you change the exposure mode to close-up or food, the focus box becomes smaller. 
This allows you to pinpoint an area of focus. Use the multi-selector arrow keys to move either type of focus box. Press OK to return to the center of the screen. If the mode dial is set to portrait, child, or several of the other scene modes, the camera will look for faces to focus on. This special focus point can move with the subject. Once you have a subject for focus, half press the shutter release. The focus box turns green. It may blink until focus is achieved. The camera sounds a soft beep. When the camera is unable to focus, the focus point turns red and continues blinking. If you're not sure which exposure mode to select for your scene, the auto and flash off options can choose for you. The camera analyzes the scene as it focuses. It determines whether you are shooting a portrait, landscape, or other kind of subject. The camera uses this information to select an exposure mode. It displays the scene mode with a heart icon in the upper left corner of the LCD monitor. If the camera cannot determine an appropriate scene mode, it will display the auto or flash off icon with a heart. This camera can record 4 gigabytes of high quality HD video in clips up to 20 minutes long. In fact, we shot this scene using the D5300. Movie recording is possible in every exposure mode except HDR painting. The camera automatically selects the correct shutter speed, aperture, and ISO for the scene. You might have chosen a specific ISO or aperture value while working in live view. But once you begin recording video, the camera may ignore your settings in favor of obtaining a correct exposure. Begin by framing your subject in the live view monitor. If you cannot see the live view screen, take advantage of the very angle monitor. It can be adjusted to make shooting from high or low angles easier. A slight tilt may also prevent screen glare when shooting outside. Make sure the focus point is on your subject. Half press the shutter release to focus. Then press the red movie record button on top of the camera. The recording icon flashes in the live view screen during recording. Watch the countdown to see how much time you have left for your video file. Press movie record again to end recording. The live view screen is bordered with icons for the current camera settings. Most will be familiar, such as the aperture value and the white balance. Make sure to pay attention if this graphic appears on screen. The time remaining icon counts down how long until live view shuts off automatically. Try pressing the info button on top of the camera. The camera displays the movie shooting screen. You don't have to display this screen in order to shoot movies. However, it has some helpful features. This meter on the left shows the current sound level for audio recording. Check it before you begin recording to make sure the camera is picking up sound. The movie frame size appears in the upper right corner for quick reference. This screen also provides quick access to movie settings. Press the I button. Among the regular camera settings, you should see icons for movie quality and sound. You can change the camera settings for still photography from any display except the movie shooting screen. Press the I button. A smaller information display appears near the bottom of the screen. Use the multi-selector keys to highlight an icon. Press OK to open the setting display. Make your selection and press OK to confirm. As photographers, our goal is to convey our personal outlook and view of the world in the form of photographs. Good photographic composition can help you express your visual ideas. Following the guidelines of composition won't guarantee award-winning photos, but I can promise you this, your shooting will improve. I am not asking you to memorize the rules and follow them by rote. Good photographers sometimes break the rules, but they know why and they do it for a reason. 
you probably have a friend or a relative who always seems to have a stack of vacation or holiday snapshots. In every batch, there may be one or two interesting shots, but the rest are pretty boring. Most people simply don't know how to make their photos interesting. They don't know how to arrange their subjects and backgrounds in an appealing way. That's what we're going to discuss now. The principles of good composition can be learned. As you look at a potential shot through the viewfinder, move the camera around to find the best image. Also, zoom with your feet. Moving a short distance can sometimes make all the difference. Here is a concept that will help you find the best arrangement of elements. It's called the rule of thirds. It has been used by artists for hundreds of years. Divide the horizontal plane and the vertical plane into thirds. The intersections of these lines are the best places to locate important subjects. If you have a subject with prominent lines or edges, such as a building or a seascape, place them along the rule of thirds lines. A few words about horizons. Never allow the horizon to cross the image plane exactly in the middle. If you want to feature a subject that lies above the horizon, such as a beautiful sunset, place the horizon lower than the center line. If your main area of interest is below the horizon, arrange the shot so that the horizon is higher than the center line. Teach yourself to visualize the thirds when you are looking at photographs and artwork. You will notice that professional photographers use this concept all the time. You will see the rule of thirds in television commercials, movies, and documentaries. A problem with so many snapshots is that the people are so tiny you can hardly tell who they are. The photographer has tried to cram a lot of information about who and where into one photograph. It doesn't work. The solution is to get specific with your framing. Fill up the viewfinder with the important stuff, the people, and enough of the surrounding details to identify the location. Then take additional photos to explore the place, the view, the architecture, the food. A photograph, like a painting or a drawing, is a two-dimensional object. The big issue facing photographers is this. How do you depict the three-dimensional world on two-dimensional paper? How do you avoid a flat look to your photos? There are things you can do to help the viewer see the third dimension. Rule number one, you must understand the technical aspects of focusing your camera. Focus is the most important component of making a good photograph. The sharp edges and clarity of the focus subject engage the eye of the viewer. To make your area of sharp focus more forceful, contrast it against an area of softer focus. To control the line between sharp and soft focus, you must understand depth of field and put it to work in your images. The contrast of a sharply focused subject against a soft background will greatly intensify the illusion of three dimensions. A few more tips that add depth. If possible, take advantage of overlapping objects. Overlaps show that one object is in front of another object in space. Use this trick to give your photographs the feeling of space and depth in the real world. Elements of perspective can be used to enhance the third dimension. Things like a line of telephone poles going away from you, or a row of arches in a building, or a road winding off into the distance are a few examples. Buildings can be a great source of perspective clues. Look at what happens with walls and roof lines as they rise up and away from you. These are all indications that the scene has space and depth. We have talked about a number of things that you can do to improve your photographs through composition. We talked about the rule of thirds, which will help you place your subject in the photographic plane. We talked about sharp and soft focus. We also discussed ways to create depth and space. We have only begun to touch on the subject of photographic composition. If you'd like to find out more, complete books on the subject are available. Use these guidelines and you will be thinking about photographs in a new way. The advanced topics build on what you've already learned. Some of the settings we'll discuss apply only to the advanced exposure modes, but the concepts are important to understand, no matter which shooting mode you choose. Don't worry if this section seems difficult at first. 
many of the advanced features are things you grow into after you have mastered the basics. Shoot with your camera for a while. Come back and review this section in a few weeks. I guarantee all the pieces will fall into place. White balance is a topic that can either be very simple or a little more involved, based on your needs as a photographer. Happily, the camera gives you white balance settings that work well under a variety of conditions. First, a short explanation of color temperature. When we shoot photographs, we can have a variety of light sources. Each has its own characteristics. Color temperature refers to the spectrum of visible light illuminating an object. We measure the light spectrum in what is called Kelvin temperature. The physics behind Kelvin calculations can be tricky. Just think of it this way. Each color corresponds to a specific Kelvin temperature. You would get just about the same color if you heated carbon to the same temperature on the Celsius scale. For example, carbon glows red at 2000 degrees centigrade, but when it's heated to 5500 degrees, it is white hot. In the same way, the white light of the noonday sun measures about 5200 kelvins. At that time of day, the Earth's atmosphere is allowing the entire visible spectrum of light to pass through and illuminate our world. An hour after sunrise, or an hour before sunset, the curvature of the Earth and atmosphere restricts the amount of light that can reach us. When the sun is low above the horizon, the atmosphere scatters short wavelength colors, such as blue and violet. But long wavelength colors, such as red and yellow, come to us through the atmosphere, creating more golden colored light. In this case, the color temperature is lower, about 2900 kelvins. We've all seen a red sunset, or the golden light that is so beautiful an hour before the sun goes down. The light given off by incandescent bulbs is similar to this light. In contrast, candlelight is very red, with a very low color temperature. Think of how your friends look sitting in front of a fireplace. Firelight is about 1900 kelvins. We're not talking about the intensity of the light, but rather the composition of the light spectrum. Most of the time, we want to represent the true color of something. We want the people in our pictures to have natural skin tones. This camera has many settings for white balance. Each is designed to compensate for a specific light source. Let's look at auto white balance first. For this setting, the camera meters the light coming through the lens and compensates for the color temperature being recorded. Auto white balance causes the exposure to appear as if it was made under natural sunlight. In cloudy daylight conditions, the clouds actually block out some of the longer waves, resulting in a color temperature higher or bluer than bright sunlight. Shady conditions usually have a higher color temperature, about 8000 degrees. Auto white balance filters out the blue shifting colors back toward the red and yellow range. If you are shooting indoors under incandescent light or firelight, the auto white balance shifts the color settings back toward the blue range. This shift results in skin tones that look natural. If you want this natural sunlight look, the auto white balance setting does a remarkable job. For many photographers, this is a setting that never gets changed. But you can use the optional white balance values like fluorescent or direct sunlight to create better photographs before you upload the images into your computer. Let's say you're taking a walk just before sunset. The light is making everything a beautiful golden color. The shadows are fantastic. If you are shooting JPEG images in auto white balance, the camera will shift everything toward blue to compensate for the yellow-orange light. Then, it will compress your image and store it on the memory card. That beautiful light is gone. You can use software to shift the color back toward the yellow-orange range later, but it's work that can be avoided. You will be losing data from your original image. Why? The program you use to shift the colors will compress your JPEG files a second time. This will discard more of the original data. You may decide to print this photo, but you've already given data away twice. If you set the white balance correctly at the time you take the photo, you won't have to spend time fixing it later. In order to understand exactly what the white balance setting does, we have to do a little experiment. 
Go outside on a bright day and pick a subject to photograph. Press the I button and use the multi selector to highlight white balance. Make sure it is set to auto. Take a photo of your subject. Go back into the information display and change the white balance setting to incandescent. Take another photo. Continue until you have tested each white balance setting. Review the photos on your computer. As you scroll through the images, notice that each image has a different hue. For example, the image taken with the incandescent setting looks very blue. But wait, doesn't incandescent light have an orange hue? So why did the image turn out looking blue? You have to think about it backwards. The camera shifts the color into the blue range because it is set for taking images in the equivalent of an incandescent light bulb. Under those conditions, adding blue to an image makes it look as though it was taken in natural daylight. However, the photo was taken under natural light, which includes the blue spectrum. As a result, the camera added a lot of blue on top of the already present blue light. The result is an image that is very blue. Conversely, when the white balance is set to shade, the camera will shift the color balance toward the red end of the spectrum. Under natural daylight, which includes reds and oranges, you will end up with an abundance of orange and yellow hues in your image. So if you're shooting an hour before sunset and you want to capture the golden light, try setting the white balance to direct sunlight rather than selecting auto white balance. This will record more of the yellow-orange light your eye perceives. Exposure compensation is one of the most important controls on your camera. Once you understand how it works, you'll use exposure compensation often to get better results. Exposure compensation can be useful for subjects that are brighter than the background. Most often, photographers set exposure compensation to correct the exposure for backlit subjects. For example, here, the camera set the exposure for the bright sky. This makes the tower in the foreground look dark. We use exposure compensation to increase the exposure for the subject in the foreground. The background is blown out, but the tower is correctly exposed. You can set exposure compensation through the information display. Press the I button and highlight the exposure compensation icon. Press OK. Use the arrow keys to select a compensation value between one-third and five EV steps. Positive values will increase the exposure for backlit subjects. This is especially helpful when shooting subjects in the shade. If your subject is brighter than the background, choose a negative value to underexpose the image. You can reduce exposure compensation to create a mood or to prevent overexposures when working with a flash. When you finish setting the compensation, press OK to confirm. You may find it's faster to set compensation by pressing this button on top of the camera. Rotate the command dial to select a compensation value. Using the button allows you to set compensation while looking through the viewfinder. You won't need to take your eye off the subject just to fine tune the exposure. Turn the dial to the right to increase the exposure. Turn the dial to the left to underexpose the image. If you select a value beyond two EV steps, the camera displays an arrow at the end of the exposure indicator. When exposure compensation is activated, this indicator appears on the information display and in the viewfinder. The following experiment will help you better understand exposure compensation. Go outside and position a subject in a shady spot that looks out onto a brightly lit scene. Set the mode dial to P, S, or A. Exposure compensation is only available for these modes and the night vision special effect. Turn on Live View. We recommend Live View for this experiment because it allows you to see the changes in exposure as they happen. Frame your subject so that you see a generous amount of the bright background. Take a photo of your subject. The camera sets an average exposure for the entire scene. As a result, your subject is underexposed. 
the bright background is correctly exposed. Press Exposure Compensation and turn the command dial to the right to increase the exposure. Take another photo. The background may be blown out, but the exposure is right for your subject. Now it's time for the second part of this experiment. Find a sunny spot that looks into the shadows. Position your subject in the sun with deep shadows in the background. Again, include a generous amount of the background in the scene. Return exposure compensation to zero and take another photo. The camera still sets an average exposure for the entire scene. As a result, your subject is overexposed. Use exposure compensation to decrease the exposure. The background will appear dark, but your subject won't look blown out. Exposure compensation is a tool professional photographers use all the time. It can be crucial to getting the exact exposure you want. Consider using exposure compensation during movie shooting. Since the camera sets the exposure automatically, compensation will allow you to achieve a specific look for your videos. Exposure compensation remains in effect when you turn the mode dial or shut off the camera. To cancel this setting, return the indicator to zero or perform a two button reset. Metering refers to how the camera measures the exposure for your scene. There are three metering options for the advanced exposure modes. They are matrix, center weighted, and spot. The default setting is matrix metering. The camera considers the brightness, contrast, and colors in the scene, as well as the distance to the subject. Based on this information, the camera sets an exposure that captures as many highlights and shadows as possible. Matrix metering does a great job most of the time. It creates an average exposure that allows you to see as much detail as possible. Next is center weighted metering. The camera still looks at the entire frame. However, it gives more importance to the 8 mm circle at the center rather than the edges of the frame. This can be a good choice for portraits. The camera makes certain your subject is correctly exposed while giving less emphasis to the background. The last option is spot metering. Here, the camera takes its measurement from a tiny area surrounding the active focus point. If focus point selection is automatic, the camera will meter at the center of the frame. Use spot metering in high contrast scenes or anytime you want to make sure the exposure is exact for your subject. You may find exposure compensation is most effective when combined with center weighted or spot metering. Selecting the right metering mode improves your chances of getting a correct exposure for any scene you'll spend less time fine-tuning the exposure settings. <music> AF Area Mode determines how you will select a focus point. But this setting does more. It also determines whether the camera will track a moving subject. AF Area Mode is selectable in every exposure and special effects mode except miniature and night vision. Press the I button and toggle to this icon near the bottom left corner. Press OK. The default setting for most of the exposure modes is Auto Area AF. For this setting, the camera chooses a focus point or points by searching for faces, objects close to the lens, or groups of objects in the center of the frame. For many instances, this may be OK, but by changing the AF Area Mode, you gain more control over the end results. We will begin with single point AF. Just as we described earlier with the close up and sports modes, single point AF allows you to select one of 39 focus points. Press the multi selector arrow keys to move the focus point to your subject. Press OK to return to the center. Use single point AF when shooting stationary subjects. This mode allows you to place your subject along the rule of thirds lines for better composition. 
Simply frame up your subject and move the focus point to him. Next, we'll look at the options for Dynamic Area AF. This AF area mode is intended for moving subjects. You still select the focus point, but the camera keeps the surrounding points active. If your subject moves away from your selected point, the surrounding points take over focusing. This allows the camera to maintain focus on your subject. With dynamic area, you can decide how many points remain active. The choices are 9, 21, or 39. Nine point dynamic area is best suited for subjects that move predictably, such as cyclists in a race. Choose 21 point dynamic area for subjects that could move unexpectedly. 39 point dynamic area is for erratic subjects. This setting is helpful when shooting subjects that are difficult to keep framed in the viewfinder. Just as in the sports mode, the AF area mode icon shows a main focus point surrounded by plus signs and shaded boxes. The number of shaded boxes will vary depending upon your dynamic area selection. The final option is 3D tracking. The camera locks onto your subject and follows its movements. In the viewfinder, the focus point moves with your subject. Begin by choosing a focus point. Initiate autofocus and keep the shutter release half pressed. Anytime your subject enters a new area of focus, the focus point moves with it. This setting can be useful when framing subjects along the rule of thirds lines. Focus on the subject in the center of the viewfinder. Keep the shutter release half pressed. Now, reframe your shot. Because the point moves, your subject will remain in focus. Getting familiar with these settings will improve your chances of obtaining a sharp focus for all of your images. One final note about AF area mode. The camera maintains the mode and focus point selection for all of the advanced exposure modes. That means that you can turn the mode dial from P to A, for example, and not worry about resetting the AF area mode. The same does not hold true for auto, scene, and special effects modes. The AF area mode will reset to its default when you turn the mode dial. We've already talked about selecting a focus point and where to focus the camera, but how do you decide when to focus? You may be photographing a subject that is completely still, or you may be at the zoo, where an animal's movement is unpredictable. When the camera focuses has an impact on the quality of your image. The D5300 has an autofocus setting appropriate for each of these situations and one for everything in between. Highlight the focus mode icon in the information display and press OK. When the mode dial is set to P, S, A, or M, the camera offers three autofocus modes and manual focus. This manual focus option is only intended for lenses that have autofocus with manual override. These lenses allow you to select manual focus from the camera rather than moving the mode switch on the lens. For most situations, you'll likely choose one of the three autofocus modes. Let's begin with single servo AF. This mode allows you to lock the focus by keeping the shutter release half pressed. If a proper focus is obtained, the focus indicator appears in the viewfinder. The camera sounds a soft beep. This setting is good for stationary subjects such as landscapes or people. Next, there is continuous servo AF. In this mode, the camera searches for the correct focus behind the active focus point. Focusing will not stop until you release the shutter. At its default, the in-focus indicator must be visible in order to take a photo. This setting is great for subjects in motion. It will help you maintain focus on animals or small children. The camera will continuously focus on your subject. If your subject moves forward or steps back, the camera will try to predict where it will end up. Finally, there is Auto Servo AF. The camera automatically sets the focus mode appropriate to the situation. 
the camera starts in single servo mode. If the subject moves, the camera will switch to continuous. If you aren't sure whether your subject will move, keep the focus mode on auto servo. That way, you don't risk missing a shot. It's important to note that the focus mode you select affects the AF area mode options. When the focus mode is set to single servo, you won't be able to select a dynamic area AF mode or 3D tracking. Your only AF area mode selections will be single point and auto area AF. The AEL AFL button allows you to lock the exposure and focus. Anytime you press and hold the button, the camera locks the focus and the currently measured exposure. This helps ensure you get a correct exposure for a backlit subject. Here's an example. If you were just to take a photo, the camera would expose for the background, leaving the subject underexposed. Instead, you can lock the exposure on an area of the scene without highlights or shadows. The resulting image will be correctly exposed. Before you begin, make certain the focus mode is set to single servo AF. In single servo mode, the camera automatically locks the focus when you half press the shutter release. This is important because you want the camera focused and ready to go before you press the lock button. Line up your subject behind the active focus point and half press the shutter release. Maintain pressure on the shutter release as you point the camera toward a neutral area. This is an area with even lighting. It will have few bright highlights or deep shadows. Now press the exposure and focus lock button. At this point, you can let go of the shutter release. By pressing the AE-AF lock button, you are maintaining a lock on both the exposure and the focus. Turn back to your subject and take your shot. Keep the button pressed to record more images with the same exposure and focus. Your results should be correctly exposed for your subject, even if the background is blown out. Exposure lock is available in every shooting mode except auto and flash off. However, you may get the best results when working in an advanced exposure mode. That's because you can select the center weighted or spot metering method. Matrix metering may not give you the best results for exposure lock. Whether the scene has high contrast, backlighting, or multiple light sources, you can ensure that your subject is properly exposed. Simply lock the exposure on an object in the scene that has an average light value. Many advanced photographers combine exposure lock with center-weighted metering. They lock the focus and metering by pressing the AE-AF lock button. Then they reframe their photo and take the shot. Just as with regular shooting, the live view AF area modes tell the camera how to focus, but how they work is quite different. For viewfinder shooting, you select a focusing method based on how many AF points you want activated. In live view, the correct AF area mode depends upon your subject and the shooting conditions. There are four modes, face priority, wide area, normal area, and subject tracking. Live view AF area mode is configurable in every exposure mode except auto, flash off, and miniature. This icon at the top of the live view screen displays the current AF area mode. Since these settings are specific to live view, you can only select them through the live view information display. Highlight this icon and press OK. Choose the AF area mode and press OK to confirm. The default AF area mode depends upon your exposure mode setting. In the programmed auto, shutter priority, and aperture priority modes, the default setting is wide area AF. This large box is your focus point. Use the multi selector to move the box to your subject. This setting is good for landscapes, shooting sports, or any time you are working without a tripod. In some cases, the camera might focus behind your subject. 
This can happen if your subject is smaller than the focusing box. In these situations, choose Normal Area AF. You will find it easier to get pinpoint focus on your subject using the smaller focusing box. Now, let's see how face priority works. This setting helps you take portraits and group shots. When the camera detects a person in the scene, it places a double framed focus point over his face. For a group photo, the camera places a double framed point over one face and single frame points over the other faces. Use the multi selector to move the double point to your main subject of focus. Half press the shutter release to focus. You can use face priority even when you are not focusing on a person. If the camera doesn't detect a face, AF area mode will temporarily switch to wide area AF. Use the multi selector to move the point to your subject. The double framed point will only appear if a face enters the frame. For this reason, you could leave the AF area mode on face priority all the time. Just let the camera switch between face priority and wide area as needed. The final live view AF area mode is subject tracking. Use this setting to follow a moving object as it travels through a scene. When you choose subject tracking, a special focus point will appear. Move the box over to your subject and press OK. The camera registers the subject and turns the point yellow. Half press the shutter to focus. The point turns green when the camera achieves focus. Now, as your subject moves, the camera will follow it. When you are ready, press the shutter release to take the photo. To disengage tracking, press OK again. Then, choose a new subject. You can focus in this AF area mode without registering your subject. However, the camera will not engage tracking. If you decide you want to activate tracking, press OK to register your subject. This AF area mode could be useful for shots of moving subjects, such as animals or sailboats. When shooting with a special effect mode, subject tracking is only available for silhouette, high key, low key, and HDR painting. There are three focus mode options for shooting stills and movies in live view. From the Live View information screen, highlight this icon and press OK. The options are Single Servo AF, Full Time Servo AF, and Manual Focus. Single Servo is the default setting for all of the exposure modes. The Focus Mode icon is displayed here on the Live View screen. Single Servo AF is meant for stationary subjects. The camera begins focusing when you half press the shutter release. Once focus is achieved, it remains locked until you let up on the shutter release. Use this setting for portraits, landscapes, or macro photography. For moving subjects, choose Full Time Servo. Autofocus begins as soon as you activate Live View. The camera continuously focuses on the subject behind the current focus point. Focus is initiated without pressing the shutter release. The point turns green if the camera can achieve focus. If it can't, the point turns red and continues blinking. Once the camera achieves focus, press the shutter release completely to take the photo. The camera rechecks the focus before recording the image. There are some advantages to selecting full time servo when shooting movies. Because the camera is actively tracking your subject, you can maintain focus throughout the video. Combine full time servo with subject tracking for situations when you want to ensure focus on a moving subject. The camera will track your subject throughout the video. This reduces the chances of recording video that is out of focus. Be aware that the camera disables full time servo in the color sketch, toy camera, and miniature special effects modes. In addition, the camera takes longer to focus in live view than regular shooting, regardless of the live view focus mode. If you need the camera to focus quickly, turn off live view and focus through the viewfinder. Use live view only when you want to shoot movies.
The pop-up flash can enhance the quality of your photographs under a variety of lighting conditions. However, the light it emits can look artificial. The flash may produce harsh shadows and blown out highlights on your subject. With the correct settings, this flash can flatter your subject instead. Many beginning photographers let the camera decide when the flash is needed. Usually, that means the camera pops up the flash for night photography or when shooting indoors under low light. Here's a tip. Use your flash outside under bright sunny skies. With the appropriate settings, the flash will fill in some of the harsh shadows created by the sun. Consider using the flash for backlit subjects. Exposure compensation can blow out the details in the background. Instead, use the pop-up flash to illuminate your subject. This camera offers a variety of flash modes based on three main settings. Their icons can be rather confusing. Press the flash button on the front of the camera to pop up the flash. Now, hold down the flash button and turn the command dial to choose a flash mode. You can change the flash setting in the advanced exposure modes and several of the scene and special effects modes. The options you'll see depend upon the exposure mode. For example, this icon says slow for slow sync. The next icon says rear plus slow sync. Change the exposure mode and the rear icon appears again. Only this time it's just rear curtain without slow sync. Select the night portrait scene mode and you see an auto version of slow sync. In order to understand these settings, you need to know what slow sync, rear curtain, and front curtain mean. Slow sync refers to how the camera exposes for the subject and the background. Usually, slow sync exposures have shutter times that are 1 60th of a second or longer. Front and rear curtain refer to when the flash fires. It's about timing, not exposure. If you select a flash setting that offers slow sync, the flash fires to illuminate the subject. At the same time, the camera collects light from the background. The longer the shutter stays open, the more light there is to expose the background. When the flash fires during this process depends upon whether the camera is set for front curtain or rear curtain. For front curtain, the flash fires immediately after the shutter opens. With rear curtain, the flash doesn't fire until just before the shutter closes. This flash mode creates the illusion of forward motion in your images. In addition, use rear curtain to freeze your subject at the last moment before the shutter closes. You won't see the word front or front curtain on any flash icon. So, how do you know whether the flash setting is front curtain or rear curtain? The best indicator is this. If you don't see the word rear, then the flash will fire at the beginning of the shot. You'll likely use front curtain sync for most shooting situations. It is very useful if you just need to fill in some shadows on your subject. Choose a flash mode with red eye reduction if you want to prevent the red eye problem in portraits. Take the time to look at the flash modes for each exposure mode. Think about the situations when you might use these settings. You'll have a better understanding of how to set the flash to get the results you want. We have all seen that typical overexposed flash look in snapshots. If you adjust the flash power, you won't have to worry about any blown out images. The D5300 allows you to change the flash intensity when working in the advanced exposure modes. In the information display, highlight flash compensation. Press OK. Use the arrow keys to increase the flash intensity. The limit is one EV step. This is equivalent to doubling the default flash power. It's more likely, however, that you'll need to decrease the flash intensity. You can reduce the flash power by as much as three EV steps. Press OK to confirm. Reducing the flash intensity creates the look of a typical fill flash. 
use this option when taking photos of back or side lit subjects. This viewfinder icon appears when flash compensation is active. Press the flash and compensation buttons together to display the flash compensation value. Turn the command dial to select a new value. To cancel flash compensation, return the value to zero or perform a two button reset. If you want to learn more about lighting and external flashes, pick up one of Blue Crane Digital's DVDs on Nikon speed lights. These DVDs offer a comprehensive look at speed lights. They include an overview of flash sync modes, and the presentations offer detailed instructions for setting up your speed light. In addition, we'll demonstrate practical lighting techniques that will help take your flash photography to the next level. One advantage of shooting movies with a DSLR is you have a lot of control over depth of field. The techniques we discussed earlier for controlling depth of field in photographs also apply to recording videos. As you may recall, one of the four factors for controlling the depth of field is lens aperture size. You can select the aperture size for movie shooting, but you must do this before turning on live view. Turn the mode dial to A or M. Set the aperture value while the camera is still set for viewfinder shooting. Choose a depth of field that enhances the composition. A narrow aperture keeps everything in focus. Your audience can take in the entire scene at once. Dial the aperture wide open if you want the audience to focus only on the main subject. This creates a shallow depth of field. Once you have set the aperture, Activate Live View. The selected value appears on the Live View screen. Half press the shutter release to focus. When you are ready, press the Movie Record button to begin recording. The camera uses the current aperture value as it records. If you want to set a different value, you must turn off Live View. Select a new aperture, then turn on Live View again and begin recording. The new value appears on screen. If you try to change the aperture value while Live View is active, it won't have any effect on movie shooting. One workaround is to record a still image. The action of closing and reopening the shutter resets the aperture to the newly selected value. Movie settings determine the size and quality of your videos. Open Movie Settings from the Shooting menu. There are three options, Frame Size, Frame Rate, and Movie Quality. The Frame Size and Frame Rate are grouped under one submenu. Movie Quality is adjusted separately. If the movie shooting screen is active, you can also open Movie Settings from Live View. Here, all three settings are grouped on one screen. The default movie size is 1920 by 1080 with a frame rate of 60p. Movie quality is set to normal. You can leave these settings on their defaults. The camera will record full high definition video. This allows you to shoot both static and action scenes without worrying about your video looking choppy. The default settings offer a great deal of versatility. However, in certain situations it might be necessary to change these settings. For example, say you want to record a video and post it on a website. The 1920 by 1080 frame size might be too large for the site. You could take one step down from Full HD by selecting 1280 by 720 video. This is still considered HD quality, but it requires less memory. What if you need to shoot an entire t-ball game? Select the 640 by 424 standard definition option. This may allow you to record several 30 minute clips on one memory card. Now let's take a look at the video quality setting. By default, movie quality is set to normal. If you select high, the amount of data recorded will increase by 50% or more. You may only need the high quality setting for color correcting or adding effects and editing. The normal quality setting will allow you to shoot longer 
without needing to change the memory card. The final image property setting we will discuss is frame rate. This setting refers to the number of frames recorded per second of video. Understanding the different frame rates can be confusing. Many of the options are for advanced users. For our purposes, all you need to remember is this. More frames equals smoother video. Some photographers prefer 24 frames per second because that's the frame rate used for film. This works well provided there isn't a lot of movement in the scene. Choose 30 frames per second to record smooth video of scenes with moderate amounts of movement. If there will be a lot of action, choose one of the 60 frames per second options. The action in the resulting clip will appear smoother. We should note the 30p and 60p frame rates are for NTSC video systems. NTSC is most commonly used in North America and parts of Asia. If your video will be broadcast in Europe, Africa, or the Middle East, then you'll need to change the camera's video mode setting. This option is in the setup menu. Now the frame rates are geared toward the PAL system. Your choices are 24, 25, and 50 frames per second, instead of 24, 30, and 60. The audio you're hearing was recorded with the camera's built-in stereo microphone. It's probably not how you want your videos to sound. The built-in mic records a stereo audio track. Full-time servo focusing may interfere with the sound recording. It is sensitive enough to pick up the turning of the command dial. You may even hear the vibration reduction motor on your lens. An external microphone such as this provides much better results. This allows you to handle the camera as you shoot without affecting your audio. An external microphone minimizes the chances of recording any camera noises. The camera has a microphone connector under the left side cover. It fits a stereo mini pin jack such as this. Once the microphone is plugged in, the camera automatically turns off the built-in mic. Adjust the sensitivity through the microphone option in the movie settings menu. Or from the live view movie screen, press the I button. Highlight the microphone icon and press OK. At its default setting, the camera adjusts the levels automatically. You might decide to leave this setting on auto when shooting home movies. And I have this. In addition, Choose auto if your audio source might move closer to or farther away from the camera. Select manual sensitivity when shooting interviews or other stationary subjects. Use the arrow keys to increase or decrease the audio levels. You want the meter to peak at about negative 12 decibels. Just be aware, if you set the level too high, your audio will sound distorted. To learn about audio recording and more, pick up Blue Crane Digital's Shoot Great Video with your Nikon DSLR. This DVD demonstrates how to shoot professional quality video with a DSLR. It includes lighting techniques, tips for avoiding aliasing, and advice on outputting great looking video. The D5300 is Wi-Fi enabled, allowing you to record great photos with the camera and share them instantly, instead of relying on a camera phone. But Wi-Fi does more. You can use it to record images remotely through your smartphone or tablet. Remote shooting allows you to take photos of your entire group together, or record images from extreme angles. Nikon's wireless mobile utility is available for both Apple and Android products. Download the free app to your smartphone or tablet. The iPhone and Android apps work in a similar way. For that reason, we will only show the setup for one type of device. This setup method involves connecting to the camera using the camera's service set identifier, or SSID. Again, it works for both types of devices. Press menu and open the setup menu. 
It's the menu with the wrench icon. Scroll down to Wi-Fi. Press OK to enter the menu. Then enable the network connection. It might take a moment to activate. Highlight network settings and press the right arrow key. On the next screen, highlight View SSID. Press the right arrow key. You will need to look for this number on your smart device. Exit the SSID screen on your camera and open the wireless settings on your phone or tablet. You should see the camera's SSID on the list of wireless networks. Select the SSID and connect to the camera. If the connection is made, you should see a wireless icon flash on the camera's information display. Note that Wi-Fi turns off if left inactive for more than five minutes. Close the wireless network list and open up the wireless mobile utility app. Tap the Take Photos icon. The next screen shows the live view image as well as the exposure settings. The camera should focus automatically when the screen turns on. Notice the size and type of the focus point. This will depend upon the live view AF area mode selected on the camera. If subject tracking was active, the camera defaults to wide area AF. Tap your subject to move the focus box. The camera will refocus. When you are ready, tap the camera icon at the bottom of the screen to record an image. The camera will save the image to the memory card and save a JPEG copy to the phone or tablet. The image thumbnails appear at the bottom of the screen. The camera records only one image at a time, even when the release mode is set to continuous. You can set a self-timer. Tap the gear icon at the top of the app screen. Slide the self-timer switch to on. Tap the gear icon to return to shooting. When the self-timer is active, this icon appears on the app screen. The timer turns off automatically after recording one image. The shoot option allows you to switch from remote shooting to camera shooting. WMU controls the camera through your smart device. Choose camera if you want to record images from the camera. The images will be saved automatically to your smart device. To return to the main utility page, tap the top icon. Now, try tapping View Photos. You can look at photos on the camera's memory card, the latest downloads, and any other images saved on your device. Nikon's picture controls allow you to manage the tonal properties of your images. Think of this feature like the old-style film stock. Before the advent of digital cameras, different kinds of film produced different looks. Computer editing programs can accomplish the same goal, but you can save a lot of post-processing time by setting the tonal properties in advance. For instance, select portrait for shooting photos of your friends. This setting enhances skin tones. It also reduces image sharpness for a softer look. Compare these results to an image taken with the landscape picture control. Landscape enhances the greens and blues. Image sharpness is increased for a more vibrant look. Picture controls are only available for the advanced exposure modes. Highlight this icon on the information display to open picture controls. The options are standard, neutral, vivid, monochrome, portrait, and landscape. Make your selection and then press OK. The default is standard. This setting produces balanced colors appropriate to most scenes. Choose neutral for the fewest image enhancements. Vivid produces a sharper, more saturated photo. Monochrome is for black and white photography. Each picture control can be adjusted to suit your needs. This is only possible through the shooting menu. Choose set picture control. Highlight a picture control from the list of options and then press the right arrow key. The camera opens a new page where you can adjust the picture control parameters. The options are sharpening, contrast, brightness, saturation, and hue. 
The A setting tells the camera to adjust the parameter automatically for the scene. Quick Adjust allows you to enhance or mute the sharpening, contrast, and saturation all at once. Use the arrow keys to choose an individual setting and make adjustments. The monochrome picture control is slightly different. You can add filter effects, such as yellow or red. Choose toning if you want to tint your monochrome image. Once you finish adjusting the picture control, press OK. The icon for the picture control you selected appears in the information display. The asterisk denotes that the setting has been changed from its default. To restore settings to their defaults, return to the parameter screen. Press the delete button, highlight yes, and press OK. You could also reset the shooting menu. Now that you understand how most of the camera settings work, let's look at the special effects modes. Special effects allow you to create a photoshopped look in the camera. Later, we'll show you how to immediately share these images by uploading them to your smartphone or tablet. There are nine special effects modes that you can use to add creative touches. Night vision records monochrome images in extremely low light. This will likely result in grainy photos and videos. If you select night vision, you may prefer to shoot in live view. Autofocus is only available for live view shooting. For viewfinder shooting, you must focus manually. Autofocus is available for the other effects modes. You don't have to shoot in live view. However, some effects can only be set up in live view. Once the parameters are set, you can switch to viewfinder shooting. In order to ensure you have the photos you want, you need to review them before moving on to a new subject. After all, you can't go back and take a second shot once you are sitting at your computer looking at your images. Press playback to display images on the memory card. The most recent photo or last viewed image appears in the monitor. Press the right arrow key to see the next image or the left arrow key to see the previous images. Use the full screen view to evaluate the exposure settings. Scenes that look blown out or are too dark may need exposure compensation. Next, magnify each photo to check the focus. When you press the zoom in button, a small yellow box appears on screen. This represents the enlarged area. Use the multi-selector keys to move the box to your subject. Turn the command dial to see more images at the same magnification. These icons indicate the camera detects one or several faces in the image. In the lower right corner of the screen, a white box will appear over each face. Press the I button. Use the multi-selector arrow keys to choose a face. Press OK to zoom in on the face. Use the right and left keys to switch between faces. Press the I button and OK to return to full screen view. Pressing the zoom out button will also return the image to full screen view. If you continue pressing zoom out, the camera brings up four thumbnail images, then 12, then up to 80 images. Finally, the camera displays a calendar view of all your images. Use the arrow keys to choose a shooting date. Press zoom out to move the highlight box to the list of images at the right. Use the up and down arrow keys to select an image from the list. If you press and hold the zoom in button, the camera displays a larger thumbnail center screen. Press zoom out to return to the calendar. You can review movie files in the monitor as well. Press OK to play the video. The right and left arrow keys are the fast forward and rewind controls. Press the down arrow to pause the video, or the up arrow to stop. The zoom buttons serve as volume controls. If you wish to erase a file, press the delete key. Press delete a second time to approve. To protect an image from deletion, 
press the AE-AF lock button during playback. This key icon indicates the file is protected. Press AE-AF lock again to cancel protection. You can erase an entire day's worth of images from the calendar view. Simply highlight a date and press the delete key twice. Now that you have checked your photos, you can quickly share them with friends using the built-in Wi-Fi. First, choose a photo in playback. This process will not work with movies. Now, press the I button. In the dialog box, highlight Send to Smart Device. Press OK. This icon indicates the photo is selected for upload. If you change your mind, press the I button again. With Send to Smart Device highlighted, press OK to deselect the image. Connect the camera to your smart device. Open the wireless mobile utility and tap View Photos. The app will tell you the camera has images selected for upload. Choose OK to begin transferring the images. The playback menu has options for uploading or deleting groups of images at once. This can save a lot of time. Say you want to delete a few photos from a series of 24. Go to Delete in the Playback menu. Highlight Selected and press the right arrow key. Now you can scan through six thumbnails at a time. Use the arrow keys to highlight an image, then press Zoom Out to select it. When you are done, press OK. Choose Yes and press OK to confirm. For Select Date, the camera displays your shoot dates as a list. Press the right arrow key to add a check mark to the dates you wish to erase. Press the arrow again to remove the check mark. When you are done, press OK and then confirm the deletion. To delete an entire folder, choose All. The camera will erase all files in the current playback folder. Next, let's see how to mark a group of photos for upload. Highlight Select to Send to Smart Device from the Playback menu. Press the right arrow key. Use the Zoom Out button to mark images you want to upload. When you are done, press OK. Later, Use the wireless mobile utility to send all the images at once to your smart device. Finally, let's look at how to display the camera settings during playback. The D5300 offers a total of seven photo information screens. Open playback display options from the playback menu. Use the right arrow key to add check marks to the screens you want displayed. Press OK to confirm the selections. Now, Press Playback to display a photo. When you press the up or down arrow key, the information screen changes. For example, the overview screen shows the camera settings for each image. Check the highlight screen to make sure your images aren't overexposed. Areas with blown out highlights will blink. Details in these areas are gone forever. If large sections of the photo are blinking, Use exposure compensation to decrease the exposure. Remember, the information in this and the other playback displays is meant to support your decision of whether the image looks good. That's what really matters. If you like the way the exposure looks now, you'll probably like it later. Now that we have talked about some of the menu options, you may have a sense of how large and complex the menu system can be. Luckily, Nikon provides a way to streamline the entire menu system. It's called My Menu. This gives you a screen for just the settings you use the most. In the menu system, toggle down to the notepad icon. This icon provides access to both the My Menu settings and a list of the most recent setting changes. Select Choose Tab and press the right arrow. Highlight My Menu and press OK. Now select Add Items to begin building your menu. Choose a menu to work from and press the right arrow key. Use the arrow keys to highlight the setting you want. Press OK. 
press OK or the right arrow key twice to return to the menu list and select more items. As you add each setting, you can use the up and down arrow keys to change its ranking in My Menu. If you decide to change the order in My Menu later, return and select Rank Items. Highlight the option you wish to move and press OK to select it. Move the cursor and press OK again to confirm. If you need to remove an item from My Menu, return to the main screen. Highlight Remove Items and press the right arrow. Use the right arrow to add a check mark to settings you want to remove. Press OK twice to confirm. The custom settings menu is one that some photographers avoid. It doesn't have to be intimidating. First, it's important to understand that custom settings don't make this camera more powerful. They simply allow you to change camera operations to better fit your shooting needs. For example, a sports photographer may select certain custom settings based on his shooting style and subjects. A landscape photographer has different needs. He would choose custom settings that relate to his shooting style. There are 22 custom settings for the D5300. The custom settings are subdivided into groups to make them easier to locate. An asterisk next to the custom setting number indicates the value is no longer set to the default. We'll cover a few custom settings we think are important. Because this section goes by quickly, we encourage you to pause the presentation. Test each setting for yourself. The A group of custom settings affects the camera's autofocus functions. A1 allows you to decide whether the camera must achieve focus in continuous AF mode. By default, the camera can't release the shutter and record an image until it's fully focused. Focus priority is very helpful for photographing children, pets, or slower speed action. You can be certain all of your images are focused. However, focus priority can slow down your shooting speed. The camera won't record 5 frames per second if it has to confirm the focus before each shot. When shooting speed is important, change custom setting A1 to Release Priority. Now, when you set the focus mode to Continuous Servo, the camera records every image, regardless of whether the subject is in focus. Let's skip down to the C group for custom setting C3. This allows you to change the self-timer countdown. The default is 10 seconds. Choose 2 seconds, for example, if you are using the self-timer to avoid camera shake. You won't have to wait as long for the camera to release the shutter. The delay between pressing the shutter release and the actual shot minimizes any camera shake. Custom settings in the D group allow you to customize the shooting and camera displays. You may wish to turn on D2, for example. This adds grid lines to the viewfinder. These lines will help you frame horizons or architectural elements. Custom settings in the F group program the camera controls. Custom setting F1 allows you to program the function button on the side of the camera. By default, pressing the function button activates the ISO setting. Turn the command dial to select the ISO value. One of the other camera functions might be more useful to your shooting style. If you think you might change the white balance setting often, then assign it to the function button. Now, when you press the button, you can set the white balance directly from the information display. Explore the other options when you have time. You might find it useful to have a frequently used camera setting just a button push away. To return the custom settings to their defaults, select Reset Custom Settings at the top of the menu screen. Choose Yes and press OK to confirm. We have discussed many of the settings you will need for everyday shooting, but there is much more to photography. If you want to take your pictures to the next level, then pick up our advanced series Through the Eyes of a Pro. This two-volume set takes you far beyond camera buttons and dials. 
Watch over Tim Mantuani's shoulder as he walks us through a commercial photo shoot. Through a series of interviews and discussions, Mantuani describes a process and structure for photography that will get you shooting like a pro. This is not a technical presentation on specific camera functions. Instead, it will help you develop your skills by showing you how photographers approach their craft. Blue Crane Digital also offers a quick reference guide for your camera called InBrief. This field reference tool answers the most common questions about camera operation and customization. Settings are organized into color-coded panels. This makes finding specific settings easier. For instance, if you have a question about white balance, you would check the purple panel. Because in brief can be folded to fit in your bag, you won't need to pack the camera manual when you go out on a shoot. Visit our website for additional training material related to your camera. Choose Nikon and D5300 from the list. Then click Go. This sends you directly to a page of recommended items for the D5300. We have covered a lot of ground over the course of this presentation. Some of it may seem very complicated now. However, it will make more sense as you begin to use the camera. What we hope you take away from this presentation is a solid understanding of how the main camera controls can help you take great photos. Be sure to practice the settings and techniques we've discussed. Look for opportunities to improve the composition of your images. Soon, you will be taking better photos than ever before. Thanks for watching. Now go out and take some great photos.